So I'd like to start by thanking the Physiological Society for this wonderful introduction in this uh, lovely city at this fascinating meeting, and Jonathan for that kind introduction. Um, my talk today, the Hodgkin Huxley Caps Lecture, will be on how fixed circuits generate flexible behaviors. And my first slide here um, is not my experimental organism, but rather the organism that was studied by Hodgkin Huxley and cats, the squid. And um, this is just a sort of a moment to take a moment to reflect about the contributions of these three great scientists, especially since um, Sir Andrew Huxley died just May 31st after a long and distinguished career in neuroscience and neurophysiology, and really marks the ending of what these three fantastic scientists did and contributed to the field of neuroscience. Um, they, it, it's, a, it's a bittersweet moment to remember all they've contributed and realize that we are now um, destined to carry on without them, but it's also a good reminder of all of the different ideas they brought to us. So for example, what they brought to us in their studies of the squid was the realization that you had to solve the science in a system in which it could be solved, that the techniques of electrophysiology were possible in that rather bizarre animal at a time that they simply weren't possible in other systems. And in the same way, um, the kinds of work that we do has really been empowered by the fact that certain kinds of experiments are possible in simple organisms that are not possible in more complex organisms. So neuroscientists are humans, and we are really predominantly interested in the human brain, the billions of neurons and trillions of synapses that make up the, our ability to think, to act, to remember, and to feel. But this is an almost intractable problem at this point, and we feel that there are insights that we can gain into the system by studying much simpler nervous systems. The nervous system that I study is that of the nematode worm, Cenorhabditis elegans, developed as an experimental system by Sidney Brenner and his colleagues at the MRC in Cambridge. And um, from the point of view of neuroscience, its incredible attraction is that it has only 302 neurons with about 7,000 synapses, and yet it's an animal that can navigate through its environment, make decisions, sense different things, and even learn with this small anatomy. Now, it also has a variety of different genes, many of which it shares with more complex animals, and many of the principles of the way the neurons function or their synapses function are, in fact, quite similar between worms and other animals, enabling us to use these kinds of molecules to translate between the functions of simple brains and more complex brains. And from our perspective, um, a wonderful thing that we have available in C. elegans that's not available in any other system is an incredibly well-defined anatomical connectivity, a wiring diagram of the worm brain worked out first by John White, recently completed by Mitya Chikolovsky, um, in which we can understand the relationships between each of these neurons, here a different colored ball, and each of the other neurons in the form of the synapses between them. Now, there's a field growing up these days with a rather unfortunate name of connectomics, um, which attempts to describe large pieces of more complex nervous systems using this kind of complete anatomical reconstruction, in this case from electron micrographs. And when we work on C. elegans, we have to remind ourselves that, in fact, we've had something like the connectome for 25 years. Yet simply by looking at these patterns of connections, it's not really obvious how this nervous system works. There's not enough information in the anatomy to describe behavior. We can say that the sensory neurons here in red um, tend to connect to intermediate neurons in blue and ultimately to motor neurons in green. But these neurons are very heavily connected to one another, and it's possible to get from almost anywhere to almost anywhere else in just a few synapses. So there have to be things that are shaping this wiring diagram that help us to understand how it works. And in fact, many people with uh, theoretical interests have, have examined the C. elegans wiring diagram, and again, have not been able to come up with plausible models for how information flows through this system, except in the most general of ways. And what I'd like to suggest in today's talk is that that is because um, in the methods of theoretical neuroscience and in our ways of looking at connections, we tend to make a set of assumptions, assumptions about how the nervous system works, that neurons, for example, um, are roughly similar in their basic properties and that everything interesting happens in the connections between them, um, that their properties are stable intrinsically and that their synaptic outputs are stable and that they perform one computation at a time when transferring information through this network. 
And what I'd like to tell you today is ways in which I believe that those assumptions are actually violated by what we know about the C. elegans wiring diagram that in fact neurons are not stable and that they are not simply predictable, that there is not one wiring diagram but many wiring diagrams which operate on different time scales and which are regulated in different ways. And I will explain that by um, talking about the way the anatomical connections, the chemical synapses and gap junctions, interact with modulatory systems, and also by talking about three different time scales on which the nervous system is dividing up information and transforming it to give rise to behavior. Time scales of hours that provide flexibility to neural circuits, time scales of minutes that allow a rapid behavior to be organized, and time scales of seconds that allow the same circuit to carry out different computations on faster and slower time scales. So what is our system? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? We're trying to understand how the worm's brain generates the worm's behavior. And one of the most interesting worm behaviors described originally in the 1970s is chemotaxis. C. elegans has an incredibly complex olfactory system. It has about 2,000 G-protein coupled receptors whose main job is to detect odors in the environment. And these molecules are mainly expressed on a handful of sensory neurons in the head of the animal that detect hundreds of different environmental chemicals, probably thousands, and allow the animals to approach or avoid them. And the individual sensory neurons have well-defined functions. If you eliminate a sensory neuron, you eliminate a very characteristic subset of behaviors, like this blue neuron here, AWC, is required for odor chemotaxis. And right next to it is this red neuron, ASH, that's required for escape behavior. And these neurons are both necessary and to some extent sufficient for generating behaviors. So you can show, for example, that by activating one of these escape neurons optogenetically with light, by flashing the light, you can trigger in the worm an escape behavior that's indistinguishable from the escape behavior it would normally generate to, to odors that activate the ASH neuron. So these neurons are recognizable in each animal, and their functions are characteristic. And we can follow them to try to understand how those behaviors are generated. Now, the first thing you need to understand these behaviors is to have a model for how the behaviors work. And when we look at chemotaxis behavior in C. elegans, we do not see the sort of rapid, reliable escape behavior that I saw, showed you on the last slide. Instead, we see a complex behavior called the biased random walk, which is the same behavior as is used for bacteria in their chemotaxis, as shown originally by Howard Burke and his colleagues, um, and was worked out for C. elegans by Sean Lockery and his colleagues a decade ago. The strategy of a biased random walk is that an animal moves through its environment, detecting not the absolute amount of odor or the direction that odor which is coming from, but rather just noticing whether the odor concentrations are increasing or decreasing. Animals moving freely will periodically change direction. But if the odor concentration is increasing, if the animal is approaching an attractive odor, it will make fewer turns, and that will cause it to make a longer run and to approach the odor more closely. If the odor concentration is decreasing, if the animal is moving in the wrong direction, it will reorient its movement and try out another direction to see if it can find a direction in which the odor concentration will increase. And so this calculation where the animal is taking the time derivative of the odor concentration allows it to reach the peak of the odor by an apparently um, chaotic trial simply by modulating the rate of reversals. Good means few reversals, bad means more reversals. And using this transformation of chemotaxis into a question of reversals and a rate of reversals, which turns out to be about one reversal per minute, it's possible to move through the circuitry, starting from the neuron that triggers chemotaxis, through the neurons to which it's connected, and a set of downstream neurons to generate different kinds of behaviors. In particular, this neuron, AWC, which is required for chemotaxis, has the role of regulating turning rates with respect to odors, stimulating turning when odor is falling, um, suppressing turning when odor is rising. It mediates these functions through a group of four neurons to which it is directly or indirectly connected, and these neurons then transfer that information to a set of other neurons which ultimately lead to different motor outputs that can help the animal to change direction. So each of these neurons is involved here at this top level in the coordinated control of turning rate, and it's this problem that I will talk about next. So how do these neurons um, 
actually function to control turning rates. Now, the important lesson from Hodgkin, Huxley, and Katz is that to understand neurons, we need to record their activity. We need to examine what they're doing at different times with respect to different stimuli. And in the case of C. elegans, um, the technologies for these have been enormously enhanced by the development of genetically encoded indicators for neural activity. The one that we use tracks calcium levels, an indirect reporter of depolarization. This molecule, GCAMP, can be expressed under cell type specific promoters and delivered to animals that are trapped in microfluidic chips to have odors delivered to them to then monitor the activity of the neurons that are engaged in regulating chemotaxis and related activities. So using this technique, we are able to report that these neurons not only are required for the detection of odors, but actually respond to the presence or absence of odors, as is predicted by the behavior. Now, what was not predicted by the behavior and what we did not know until we made this first measurement was that these neurons, um, the sensory neurons here, are activated not by the addition of odor, their natural ligand, but rather by the removal of odor. So when odor is added, calcium is um, actually slightly suppressed. When odor is removed, there is a large increase in calcium indicating depolarization. Now, I just want to remind you that it's when odor is removed that this animal has to do something. When odor is removed, it wants to start turning to change direction to find a new and better condition. So this actually tracks its behavioral function well. Now, um, we can also look at the downstream neurons by recording their activity using the same methods. And so, for example, here is a neuron which has an important role in also increasing the rate of turning when odor is removed. This neuron is connected to the sensory neuron by an excitatory glutamatergic connection. And this neuron also responds to odor removal in a way that depends on the presence of the sensory neuron. If the sensory neuron is absent, shown here in red, the signal is not generated. So here are two of the neurons involved in this turning behavior. Um, here are two other neurons that are also involved in the coordinated control of turning. These two neurons, called AIA and AIY, also respond to odor, and their response to odor is dependent on an input from the sensory neuron. But interestingly, their response is the opposite. Their response, they respond to odor addition and not to odor removal. So this increase in calcium and this change in sign indicates that they must be connected by an inhibitory synapse. And indeed, there's a glutamate-gated chloride channel expressed on these neurons, which can be activated by the same glutamate that's released to stimulate this neuron, but instead inhibits these neurons, leading to a change in sign where a sensory neuron is connected both through excitatory and inhibitory neurons to different sets of targets. Now, in order to explain how these neurons become active when the sensory neuron becomes inactive, we can actually infer something about the function of the sensory neuron, which is that it signals by graded transmission. In other words, the sensory neuron must have some amount of activity at rest that is keeping these neurons inactive. When odor is added, that tonic activity is suppressed, allowing the sensory neuron to turn off and allowing these two neurons to escape from inhibition and to become active, thereby signaling the addition of odor. When odor is subsequently removed, the sensory neuron becomes active. It activates one synapse through an excitatory glutamate receptor and silences these two neurons again. Now, this pattern of graded transmission is unusual in the mammalian central nervous system, but it's actually a well-known property of sensory neurons in many systems including the vertebrate rod and cone photoreceptors of the retina and the auditory and vestibular hair cells, which function through similar kinds of mechanisms. And very importantly, the very first electrophysiology ever done in nematodes, which was done by Tony Stretton's lab in the 1980s, demonstrated that motor neurons in nematodes in Ascaris have exactly these graded properties that we inferred for the sensory neurons in C. elegans, suggesting that this is a reasonable property of nematode neurons. Now, by looking at this circuit, we can not only infer something about the way C. elegans works, but we can begin to think about how um, it relates to other kinds of circuits. And one thing that really struck us when we looked at this particular circuit is its similarity to the very first steps of sensory processing in the mammalian retina. So the C. elegans olfactory neurons seem to be active at rest and are inhibited by attractive odors. 
exactly that property is analogous to the properties of vertebrate rod and cone photoreceptors, which are active in the dark, having a so-called dark current, and which are hyperpolarized, not depolarized, by light. In fact, even the sensory transduction pathway, which goes through a cyclic GMP second messenger, is similar in C. elegans olfactory neurons and vertebrate visual neurons. Now, downstream of the sensory neuron, the information splits into two streams through an excitatory and an inhibitory synapse, which allows the downstream neurons to differentially signal the onset of odor and the removal of odor. And similarly, in the retina, downstream of the rods and cones are the bipolar cells, which fall into two categories, on bipolar cells, which signal lights on, and off bipolar cells, which signal lights off, which are connected to the photoreceptors by excitatory versus inhibitory classes of glutamatergic synapses. Now, I don't mean to say that this is actually a conserved motif. I think it could be a convergent use of this kind of a motif in evolution to carry out the same kind of problem. But what this does suggest to us is that there might be circuit motifs that are used multiple times to solve certain kinds of problems in the nervous system that um, we might be able to recognize even across very different organisms and systems. So here, that is the basic behavior. So now I want to tell you about three different ways in which this behavior can be modulated on different time scales. And the first point I want to make is that chemotaxis behavior um, can be quite characteristic of all C. elegans when they're raised under the same conditions and subjected to exactly the same test. But this behavior is flexible. It is subject to learning in which the animal modifies the behavior based on its recent experience. So there are three different ways that we know of, for example, in which the animal can change its response to odor. If an odor is paired with a bacterium that makes C. elegans sick, that odor becomes repulsive to the animals, a negative value indicating um, an avoidance of an odor that's paired with pathogenesis. If an odor is paired with, an, with food, a moderately attractive odor can become much more attractive, and this response is sensitized. And this is work that's been done by Isel Katsura at Mishima, and more recently, Colleen Murphy at Princeton has shown that this can lead to a form of long-lasting memory that lasts many days. And finally, if an odor is paired with the absence of a food, the first, worms first become uninterested in it and then actually become appalled by it, and over time move from being attracted to being strongly repelled by the same odor. So in each case, it's the context in which the odor appears that modifies the behavior. And in, for example, these sensitization or adaptation processes, about an hour of experience is sufficient to radically change the percentage of animals responding to an odor um, from almost 100% to almost none. So how is this flexibility built in to the worm circuit? It's not built by building entirely new connections. There's a fixed circuit and a fixed anatomy that is not changing substantially over the course of an hour. Instead, that same circuit has to be used in different ways. So um, we can see that quite clearly. Um, if we do adaptation experiments and then see the drop in the behavior from attractive to no response, we see a corresponding disappearance of the olfactory response in the primary sensory neurons. Now, instead of giving us a large calcium response to the removal of odor, the sensory neuron fails to respond. So clearly, there's a desensitization that's occurred that at the periphery, that's leading to a change in the olfactory response. Now, that's um, not surprising. What's perhaps a little surprising is the mechanism by which this desensitization occurs. When we first saw that desensitization, we thought it might represent something like a simple downregulation of the G-protein coupled receptors from odors, a standard kind of desensitization observed in many sensory systems. But instead, what we find is that this desensitization, this adaptation, is actually a circuit property. It requires multiple neurons, not just the sensory neurons. So for example, in order for this desensitization to occur, the AWC neuron has to release a cotransmitter, a neuropeptide, as well as its normal transmitter of glutamate. That neuropeptide acts on a G-protein coupled receptors on one of the target neurons. And this target neuron in turn releases yet another peptide, an insulin-related peptide. Removing either of these two peptides or this receptor causes the AWC neuron to continue to signal even if odor is paired with starvation so that the animals remain attracted. 
And we can rescue these um, genes in individual cell types to really work out exactly what this circuit logic is. When we ask what happens in these mutants to the response of the sensory neuron, we find that the primary sensory neuron, AWC, which in a wild-type animal would cease to respond to odor after a long-term um, pairing of the odor and starvation, continues to respond in if the animals are mutant for either of these peptides or their receptors. And so what this result indicates is that a feedback loop involving a peptide, a peptide receptor, and another peptide actually shapes the primary sensory response of the primary sensory neuron. Um, the activity of this loop through an hour of odor exposure when paired with starvation actually causes this sensory neuron to become non-responsive to an odor. And um, this, in turn, effectively cuts off part of the wiring diagram after a brief exposure. And I'd just like to note that similar results have recently been obtained in the olfactory and taste systems of Drosophila, where it's been shown that feeding and starvation um, can lead to a sensory gating effect, which effectively cuts sensory neurons off from a circuit or coupled them to the circuit based on the context in which the animals find themselves. This form of plasticity is only one of the several forms of plasticity that can operate even in this very small circuit. So in a set of additional experiments done by Makoto Tsunizaki in the lab, we've looked at changes in odor responses that occur based on feeding and starvation and found a second set of changes that occur not through the peptide feedback loop, but through presynaptic regulation of the primary sensory neuron, where both positive and negative inputs can um, strengthen or weaken its synaptic connections to its target. And in a third set of experiments, involving the pathogen learning that I mentioned at the beginning, there are postsynaptic modulators that can come in and modulate these downstream neurons and can also effectively change the flow of information from the sensory neurons to their targets in the context of a signal from pathogenic infection that leads to a learned response. So the wiring diagram is not fixed. The wiring diagram can be modified at the level of sensory input, sensory connections to postsynaptic neurons, or the postsynaptic neurons themselves to allow different behaviors to the same odor detected by the same sensory neuron, depending on recent history. And remarkably, this is all implemented by the same biased random walk circuit. By shifting the properties of the circuit, by shifting the relative rates of reversals and um, in the presence or absence of a particular odor, it's possible for the animal to modulate its movement in different ways to lead to either approach, um, ignoring, or avoidance of the same odor. So we've become very interested in this biased random walk circuit itself and the mechanism in which these turns are regulated. Now, whereas the responses I just told you about, these forms of plasticity, take place over about an hour or so, the rate of turns in a biased random walk is about one turn per minute. And we'd like to understand what is it that regulates those turns and um, how does the nervous system transform that information into output. And to do that, what we really want to be able to do is to match the dynamics of a neuronal response with the dynamics of a behavior, to relate the functions of the neurons to the behavior of the animal in real time. And in order to do that, we have to be able to control odor stimuli very precisely and deliver them at known times and places to animals in freely moving environments. Dirk Albrecht, a postdoc in the lab, who had a background in microfluidics engineering, developed methods for doing exactly that in C. elegans to test the biased random walk model and to challenge it in different situations. And remember that the biased random walk model really cares whether odor concentrations are increasing or decreasing. It takes a time derivative. It cares about temporal gradients, not spatial gradients. So Dirk designed a device in which he could flow odors past C. elegans and thereby create artificial temporal gradients. So here are animals moving around in a device. They can move forward. They can change direction, reorient in different ways. Um, and the appearance of a dark color in a few seconds will signal the appearance of an attractive odor. The removal of that odor will be accompanied by a decrease in the color. And what you should be able to see is that when the odor appears, the worms move in long straight lines, suppressing turning. And when the odor disappears, they show a bout of turning. The odor appears, they move in long straight lines. The odor disappears, they turn. 
So this is exactly the behavior that is predicted by the biased random walk model. It says that the worms can detect the change in odor concentration over time. Now that's a qualitative result. We can turn that into a quantitative result. And this is really one of the other things that Hodgkin, Huxley, and Katz taught us. They were, in a sense, the first systems biologists who really worked hard to take biological observations to a mathematical level. And in this case, we simply want to do that kind of analysis for behaviors. We can track animals automatically. We can assign to them different behavioral states at different times. We're moving forward as a light gray and changing directions as a black or a red color. And then we can chart that out here for hundreds of animals exposed to the same kinds of pulses of odor and buffer, looking at their behavior at different times here in rasters of individual animals, and then converting that into a set of state probabilities to say, for example, that if odor has been added, there's a 90% chance that animals will be moving forward. If odor has recently been removed, there's an 80% chance that they will make a reorientation maneuver, and this falls back to baseline over the course of about 90 seconds. So we can use this quantitative analysis to now dissect different features of the, of the odor response. We can see that the responses to odors are very rapid, appearing within a second or two. We can see that they're long-lasting, that after odor is removed, the animal shows a behavioral response that indicates that it remembers the odor for about 90 seconds. Um, now, interestingly, these responses are never 100%. We never see 100% of the animals turning. We never see the numbers go above about three quarters. We can shift these numbers around, but the responses remain probabilistic and not deterministic. We can also relate this to what we know about the activity of the neurons. So for example, we know that this olfactory neuron that detects this exact odor responds to odor removal with an increase in activity that lasts around 30 seconds. Now that accounts for um, some, but not quite all, of this response here. The animal keeps turning for about 90 seconds. But at least we can say that there's a decent match of the time frame of olfactory neuron activity and the time frame of the animal's activity in this buffer. And so we can look now inside the animal to ask how the biased random walk is implemented. We can say that a sensory response is being generated reliably to odor removal, but the random element, which is actually a very important element of the math of a biased random walk, must be implemented downstream of the sensory neuron, but upstream of the motor circuits to generate a certain amount of variability in a behavioral output. And this variability on the time scale of, an, of a minute or so, um, we think is being generated by the intermediate neurons that convert a reliable sensory response in a, into a stochastic motor response. So um, for the last part of my talk here, I'm going to move to an even faster time scale and show you a different kind of behavior that animals can do in response to the same odor. So in addition to being able to give temporal gradients to the animals, um, Dirk is able to generate spatial gradients of odors that the animals can respond to, where the animals will demonstrate by their occupancy of different parts of a device um, which areas they like, which are the areas that have odors in them. And if we watch them move around, we can see that while they will move through the odor-free areas at various degrees, most of the animals are spending most of their time within the odor devices. Now this more complex geometry allows us to ask other questions about what kinds of behavioral computations the animals can do. And so um, one thing that Dirk noticed is that in this device, the animals showed us a behavior that they hadn't showed us in the temporal gradients. And that was, they showed us that they could sense along an odor edge which direction the odor was coming from. They had a spatial knowledge of where the odor was, not just a temporal knowledge of whether it was decreasing or increasing. And we could see that, for example, if an animal was moving parallel to an odor edge, it would almost invariably resolve its movement to move into the odor without making any of those pirouettes or reversals. 99 times out of 100, it would move into the odor and not away from the odor when it was traveling in this configuration in a position to sense whether odor was coming from upwards or downwards in this gradient. And Yuichi Ino's lab, um, working independently with other kinds of odor gradients, also suggested the same thing about C. elegans odor detection and um, suggested the name for this, the weather vane model, that the worm could point its nose like a weather vane um, upward toward the odor. So um, how, how could it do this? 
Um, while we were thinking about this, Sean Lockery's lab published a theoretical paper in which they thought about um, odor edges and they, and they presented a model that the animal could actually resolve this through its own active sensing of the environment. That as a worm is moving through the environment, it moves in a sinusoidal pattern, which means that it will be moving into and out of an odor along an odor edge while it's apparently moving straight. And that it would be able to track the odor and move into the odor or away from the odor simply by coupling sensory information to this natural period of locomotion as long as it could tell that the sensory information was coming here and move in this direction versus here and moving in that direction. And Sean said, in order for the animal to carry out this computation, the sensory neurons would have to be very fast. They would have to know the difference between odors within a two-second interval um, to move up or down the gradient. Now, um, I've showed you the sensory responses of this neuron already, though. I showed you that the animals can apparently carry out this computation, but the sensory neuron seems to respond rather slowly. It responds to odors with a response that lasts 30 seconds. That would involve you know, 15 of these movements here. It really doesn't seem to be in the right time scale at all to allow the animal to carry out this computation. In particular, in the case of one neuron, the AWC neuron, I've told you about two different behaviors that it can generate on two different time scales using two different computations that AWC can control a biased random walk and where turns are generated about once a minute through a slow activity in response to a large change in odor. And that AWC can also control a rapid response to fluctuating odor concentrations through a faster computation that occurs by a different route. And so in summary, um, as we look now at the wiring diagram, we can look at the assumptions that I started with about how it functions and realize that each of these assumptions has been violated by a different feature of the chemotaxis circuit. When we, we thought originally that the neurons might all be pretty similar and therefore we could just use sort of a simple model of what the neurons were doing to reconstruct this wiring diagram. But instead we see that the neurons have complex dynamics. For example, that AWC only integrates information for a second and ASH for 10 times as long. Um, we thought that they would have stable intrinsic properties, but instead we see that a peptide can change the intrinsic properties of a neuron on a short time frame. Um, we thought they would have stable synaptic outputs, but we know of many examples where the synapses are modulated by other outputs. And finally, the neurons are not just performing one computation at a time. They may be carrying out fast computations and slow computations um, simultaneously, which may be transmitted through the system in different ways. And we think, however, that this is not hopelessly complicated, but that by incorporating a few of these ideas, we may be able to build better models and perhaps even ultimately predictive models of the flow of information through this system. So my conclusion here is that we think that time in the nervous system is a parameter that needs to be considered completely independently of sort of the quality of the things that the nervous system is, is perceiving. That we think a lot about things like channels and synapses, um, and these operate on the time frame of milliseconds or even microseconds. Now, information can be propagated very rapidly for sensation, perception, and action using these. But most behaviors, feeding, mating, foraging, happen on a slower time scales of seconds to minutes or hours. And we think that properties of circuits, such as their modulation and their complex cell intrinsic dynamics, may be relevant to these kinds of computations. And of course, on longer time scales, memory and even development can shape the properties that allow this to take place. So to understand a real brain, we need to understand all of these elements. And with that, I will just celebrate um, another event. Today is a great day for science. Um, the, this is Peter Higgs, who has lived long enough to hear that the Higgs boson has apparently been detected by two independent means, um, as reported this morning. And now I will just show you the um, pictures of the people who did the work. The work on the AWC circuit was done by a postdoc in the lab, Srikanth Chalasani, now at the Salk Institute. Um, the microfluidic techniques were developed by Dirk Albrecht, together with Johannes Larsch. And the work's on temporal processing by Saul Kato, a joint student with Larry Abbott at Columbia University, and two other students, Yifan Shu and Christine Shu. Thank you.